So we have this great plan to lock 3,000 species into a confined space for a few years. We have thought of everything. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Hello, and welcome to For the Love of Bugs. In our last episode, we looked at one of the major impediments to a Mars colony. Namely, the need to create closed, self-sustaining agricultural systems. Now, this is not a new concern. This is something that had been discussed in books going back decades. And in the early 90s, a project was put in place to try and test this, the Biosphere 2 project. Now, if you were paying attention to the news in the early 90s, then this name probably already rings a bell. For everybody else, though, let's first start by explaining what the Biosphere 2 project was. The Biosphere 2 project was an attempt to understand how humans interact in a closed, self-sustaining system. So to do this, what they did is they created a massive airtight greenhouse outside of Tucson, Arizona, that they then recreated a rainforest, a savanna, a desert, an ocean, an agricultural area, and living quarters. Into these habitats, they introduced somewhere over 3,000 species of animals and plants. In 1991, they introduced eight people who were then sealed off for the rest of the world for the next two years. There was a second attempt in 1994 but ultimately, that effort was cut short by a funding dispute. So why would anybody do that? Why would they want to stick themselves in a confined space with eight other people and 3,000 species for two years? Well, depending upon who you talk to, the answers can vary quite a bit, but most of them seem to boil down to the simple attempt to try to understand how humans impact closed systems. Now this inevitably starts to bring us on over to the, some of the controversies that surrounded the project. D did the uh, project succeed in its goals? How did the system fare? Now there's a lot of information out there that covers some of the challenges in human relations that developed over the course of the project. And there's a lot of information out there that covers some of the air quality challenges that existed within the project. However, neither of those two really have anything to do with insects, so we're not really going to talk about those. Instead, we're going to focus in on the ecology and the problems that developed within the project in that regard. <laughs> So within ecology, we're going to focus mainly on ants, because ants are kind of jerks, and if something went wrong, they were probably the ones that did it. So within this Biosphere 2 project, right as they were starting to put it all together, they intentionally introduced about 11 species of ants, and they did this to fulfill a variety of ecological roles. Right before the first team went in in 1991, they carried out some surveys to determine how those ants were doing. In these surveys, they found that several of the species that they had intentionally introduced had pretty much disappeared, and that a number of species that nobody intended to introduce had already started to pop up. At the conclusion of this first test in 1993, they carried out another series of surveys. And in these surveys, they found that all of the species that they wanted to be in there in the first place had since disappeared. And in their place, the most common species of ant that they were able to find was a species that is called the crazy ant. This is a species that they hadn't even observed prior to the first team going in, but now was the most common and dominant ant. So much so that by 1996, when they conducted another series of surveys, the, uh, the crazy ant was actually 
overwhelmingly dominant. And in fact, the only bugs that were left within Biosphere 2 were the ones that were capable of surviving alongside these ants. So why does this happen? Why are introduced species of ants so much more problematic than the native species? And let's keep in mind this is not something that's unique to the Biosphere 2 project. You can find problems with introduced species of ants all over the world, whether it be the red imported fire ant in the southeast United States, or whether it be the Argentine ant, which has managed to form a super colony that appears to stretch all the way from Spain to Italy in Europe. The answer to this question is that the question itself is wrong. It's not a question of why these species are so much more competitive than the native species. It's a question of where these species are more competitive. And the best example for this is to look at cockroaches in the United States. There are about four species of, uh, four pest species of cockroach that you can find in houses or buildings throughout the United States. This would be the American cockroach, the Oriental cockroach, the German cockroach, and the banded cockroach. Now, all four of these species have something very important in common. All four of them are introduced species. Even the American cockroach, which you would think would be, I don't know, maybe American, is actually probably more likely an African species that got introduced. This is not to say that there are not native species of cockroaches in the United States. There are about 60 species of cockroaches that you can find all throughout the outdoor areas in the United States. But none of them are really great at surviving inside buildings. So when you're looking at this, and this is, this is not something that is a one-way type thing, these introduced species of cockroaches also do not do well when they move outside of the buildings. They can get from building to building, but they cannot really survive and compete with the native cockroaches in the outdoors. So when you're looking at a question of what makes something a really good introduced species, what you're ultimately looking at is that these introduced species, these pests, are singularly exceptional at being able to survive and adapt to habitats that have been disrupted by humans. And so the Biosphere 2 project ends up being a really good example of a human-disturbed ecosystem. It and other ecosystems like it tend to feature a few things, such as high rates of parasites and diseases in the plants and animals, low levels of biodiversity, high numbers of introduced species, and disruptions to the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen cycles. So why us? Why does this tend to happen in human-influenced ecosystems? Well, We'll get into that a little bit more next time, where we'll start to talk about human agricultural systems and whether there truly is better living through chemistry. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed today's video, please make sure to like and subscribe. Also, please make sure to check below for links to find us on social media. And until next time, keep your eyes on the little guys. Mm -hmm.